Well, um, good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the <coughs> organizers of, for having me here uh, today. Uh, I was actually discussing with Neil this morning and I told him that I was a little bit jealous to see that the network here is a real family, so it's really a privilege being here today. Um, when I was reading the, the description and the concept notes of the, the session and I saw that it was about both internal factors for to ensure success of reforms but also the contribution of the international community, I was tempted actually to contribute to both because um, I acted uh, as um, both, I, I was on both sides because I spent 10 years in the Ministry of Finance in Morocco and I spent uh, four years at the OECD and, and I joined recently PwC here in London. So I thought um, my contribution will cover both internal and external factors. Um, Yeah, so um, just to give you an idea about what I will be uh, presenting to you today, um, drivers for reform, so um, internal factors, but also in external actors and the, the very important role that uh, external actors could play uh, in the success of uh, budget reforms and in governance reforms more broadly. And uh, as I was working a lot on MENA countries uh, at the OECD, I was working on the, MENA, uh, the OECD uh, MENA governance program, I thought I would mention a few examples from Tunisia and Morocco, and you know that in the region since uh, 2010, sorry, <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, since the revolution, the Arab Spring, um, there are a lot of uh, names to this period. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things happening in the region, and I think it's it's very interesting to to have a few examples from these countries in addition to other countries uh, that we discussed yesterday and today. Tim uh, presented the case of Sudan uh, yesterday. We had a few examples from Uganda, from Mozambique, and from Kenya. Uh, so I think that it would be also interesting to have um, an overview about what is ha happening now uh, in in the. Middle East and North Africa. And then um, I wanted to, to finish my presentation by um, mentioning few suggestions slash recommendations for action to the network um, uh, that <coughs> this is attending uh, this conference today here. So just two words about um, effective reforms and the, the drivers of, of effective reforms. So getting the process right, I know that it's something that could look really um, simple and obvious, but when you go to developing countries, it's not always that obvious. Uh, so that the, the, poli the, the policy cycle, the mean will, is not always um, uh, respected. So going from planning to uh, doing the reforms, to checking and <coughs> evaluating the, the successes and also the mistakes and acting on this to um, to to improve the process. So it's something very simple, but it's not always respected. Effective coordination between national stakeholders. This <coughs> is something that I saw in my experience both at the Ministry of Finance and also um, the, from the projects that I was leading at the OECD. Um, it's really crucial coordination uh, within the same departments. And yesterday, uh, Richard, uh, told us a little bit about the Ministry of Finance in the session dedicated to the Ministry of Finance, and that um, people like to work in silos so departments don't talk, talk to each other, and this is um, also valid f between different departments uh, in within the government. So this is something key um, to, to succeed reforms. Uh, making best use of external actors. The, the international community is there to help countries, but I think that we need to think about how to make uh, best use of, this, of these resources. Of course, on paper, this looks challenging, and we are today talking about real life and the budgeting in r the real world, so it's, it's even more complicated. Um, this is a little scheme of some of the, the actors uh, that I tried to put together just to, uh, to show you how complex it is, and I know that you certainly know that very well, it's just a reminder. So within the, the same government you have, uh, when it comes to 
public financial reforms, you have the intervention of different um, interlocutors. So you have the center of government, and sometimes the Ministry of Finance is part of the center of government, like in Westminster systems, but it's not always the same. Um, for example, in uh, North Africa, it's not at all the same, and the center of government is quite weak. So um, coordination is sometimes done by the Ministry of Finance or by strong ministries. So th this, is, this is an important issue to which we should, uh, we should pay attention. There is the relationship between the government and the parliament, and if the parliament has enough resources and skills and expertise to, to examine the budget and also to examine uh, budget reforms. And if the parliament has an independent body, for example, to provide the lacking skills uh, and expertise. And I don't know a uh, lot of countries who, who actually have this kind of bodies. Maybe the United States uh, has one, but not a lot of uh, developed countries has one. Then there is uh, the other component of the society, and I just um, mentioned academia and research institutes uh, that could play uh, an, a very important role. And I think that the fact that ODI uh, gathered uh, all of us here today is an excellent example. Civil society has an increasing role, and now we, we talk more and more about open government, and there is an open government partnership, and civil society has clearly an important role to play. And there is also the private sector as a provider of um, good practices in public management or public financial management. <coughs> Of course, if we put all these stakeholders at national level on the, on a, in a box and then we put the international community in the other box, it is the interaction also between national actors and international actors and um, coordination among the international community, which is uh, very important, but which is not always uh, done in the right way. So I would like just to mention a few examples from Tunisia and Morocco and the challenges in implementing reforms. Um, over the last 12 months, I, I was working uh, on a budget review of, of Tunisia. So it was the first uh, budget review conducted by the OECD with the uh, MENA country. <coughs> And it was a very in interesting exercise in which we applied the same principles and instruments uh, that we apply for uh, OECD countries. And Tim was talking about capacity building activities. We had 12 capacity building activities uh, within a month. I don't say it's a, it's a good thing, and it's a good thing, of course, to, to have capacity building activities, but I think it was very intense. and. Um, I will not go into the details of the, the recommendations of the budget review itself about the, the Tunisian system, but maybe some lessons uh, that um, I learned and that could be also valid for other, um, for other countries. Um, when we talk about demand-driven um, projects, of course, we all agree. I think there is a consensus uh, <laughs> about that. But it's not always the case, even when we talk about demand-driven projects. Uh, when I started implementing these projects, I just realized that the EU, for example, was working on similar issues, um, on performance-based bu budgeting in Tunisia. So I had to, to talk to the people from the EU to coordinate and to try to avoid duplications and to make the, the best use of, of the resources. And this actually uh, helps to to have this internal buy-in, uh, both at the management level, senior level, and also at operational level, because if you don't have the buy-in from the, the country, it's really difficult to, to make a reform happen or to, to succeed in, in a project. Um, and of course, there is the sequencing and the pace. Um, it is one of, of the basics, because sometimes we are impatient, we would like to see results, uh, but we need to take into account the, ac the capacity of, of the country to, to implement reforms. Uh, and we talked a lot yesterday about, about capacities and capabilities and how to, to, improve, uh, to improve them. So I will not go, uh, so I will not talk a lot about that. Um, when it comes to external actors, I just, uh, took the, the case of Morocco, and I thought it was interesting just to put some facts uh, there on the screen and to discuss them with you. Um, from 2003 uh, to 2013, all these instruments were used. Uh, just These are the projects that are related only to PFM, of course. Maybe there are others that are related to other, you know, transparency or uh, openness or integrity. So linked to PFM, but not uh, public financial management per se. Um, 
And I, I'm not saying that it's not a good thing to have, um, you know, um, advice uh, to, to the, the government, but I think that we need to take into account uh, the capacity of, of the countries, especially that very often the same group of people is dealing with all international organizations. Um, so I think that uh, also there is a need uh, to coordinate all these uh, interventions in, in countries in order to, to build on uh, on each other's lessons and maybe avoid asking the same questions or going uh, at the same time to, to a country. It happened to me when I was working on, uh, on Tunisia, for example. Um, sometimes I realize when I'm there on mission that there are other colleagues at the OECD that are running other projects, sometimes similar projects. Uh, you know that uh, organizations uh, sometimes work in silos, so the, the, the flow of information is not always uh, um, the best one. So I think that there is a need of coordination uh, internally uh, within wi each international organization, but also between international organizations. So in Tunisia, um, at the same time and since the, the Arab Spring and the, the start of the revolution, for example, there were a lot of projects on PEFA and taxation, risk management, <coughs> performance-based budgeting, and some of them uh, covered you know some I issues. So the, the, the risk of of duplication uh, is quite high, and I think that um, we might want to think uh, about doing something about that. So the the lessons learned from from these two examples is that we we need to recognize the limitations uh, on capacity to absorb support. Support is is fantastic. It's it's um, it's very good for governments, but we need to to take into account the capacity of countries. We need to improve coordination between international organizations and to strengthen also coordination between recipient countries and international organizations. And this I I already mentioned it um, because uh, the same people are often, for example, in, in the budget directors in most uh, countries, you have the same group of people dealing with all international organizations. And in the case of Tunisia, because I spent a lot of time in Tunisia, when I had meetings with the budget director, uh, which was a lady, she used to t tell me that I have a meeting with the IMF at 10 and then at the, uh, with the World Bank at 12 and the, with the OECD at 4. So. She was a little bit complaining about, you know, the intervention of uh, the lack of coordination. She said that she's very happy uh, to have, you know, all the, the support of the international community, and it's very helpful. But there is an effort to to, to be to be made in terms of uh, of coordination. Um, so I, I I would like also to acknowledge the importance of uh, of the the efforts of the international community. So it brings high level expertise, of course, um, good practices or best practices and shortcuts. We can also learn from failures, uh, fresh views and independent analysis. It's also very useful for for countries. And last but not least, of course, funding and all these elements are really important to to countries. However, I think that there is. There is a, a room for improvement, and there is need for more coordination, of course. Again, I mentioned it a lot, and uh, it's on purpose that I repeated it. Uh, it's it's a, a very important to, to avoid duplications, to reduce resource burden and meetings fatigue, um, because sometimes, you know, when you have a meeting or international conference every week, it, there is a high risk of, of creating these meetings fatigue in countries. Um, a sharper focus on country prior priorities rather than donors' interest, and this is something that was already mentioned also yesterday. Um, so I think it's very important to focus on country countries' priorities, and that the, the the projects are based on an expression of needs uh, of the countries. A greater consistency at different level. Consistency is very important. So w one, uh, I mentioned three levels. So one level uh, is the commitment of each international organization. Uh, I was in Tunisia last week, and in the plane I was reading the newspapers, and I, the Tunisian newspapers, and I, I read an article, and um, the Tunisians were complaining about the, the international community stepping back, uh, because since um, the revolution everybody wanted to, to help Tunisia, but now some of the international organizations are, are saying that uh, the, the transition is not uh, making progress um, 
quickly enough. So maybe you will need to to step a little bit back to push them to to uh, to accelerate the, the process of reform. But I think there is a paradox here because if Tunisia is not moving uh, quick enough, uh, it is because there are uh, a lot of issues and support it's, is much uh, more needed and welcome. So I think that the, there, there is a need for consistency of commitments. Consistency of policy advice over time, because sometimes the same organization can give um, different advice if we compare between uh, periods. It could be austerity at some point. It could be support to growth at uh, another point of, of the history. So I think that there is a need to have this consistency of policy advice. And also consistency, of course, of recommendations between the international community. Um, we, one should not, uh, Tim was just mentioning this, uh, um, the, contradic the conflict in policies, for example. And I think it's very important that, for example, the OECD doesn't say something that is conflicting with the World Bank or the EU, uh, especially when there are projects that are being conducted at the same time. And again, this brings us to the importance of coordination. So here, just a few um, uh, recommendations or actions to be taken. Um, when we talk about best practices in terms of PFM, we talk a lot about fiscal transparency, about accountability, inclusiveness. Rebuilding trust is very important, information sharing and effective coordination. But I thought that these elements could also uh, are valid for the international community. Um, when we talk about transparency, we could also talk about aid transparency. Uh, we need to be transparent about how the money, it's the taxpayers' money uh, at the end of the day. So we need also to be transparent about aid. Information sharing uh, with governments and citizens, they need also to know um, how the, the projects are, are prepared and what are the objectives. Accountability, rebuilding trust uh, in the international community. I think that, uh, as Tim was saying, it's very difficult to build trust, and trust uh, comes on foot and lives on horseback. So once you have, uh, you know, uh, when trust is broken, it's very difficult to, to build it again. So I think it's very important. Um, and one thing that could build trust is also um, accepting, me to just to acknowledge that uh, also the international community could make mistakes. So um, uh, if we make a mistake, we can just say, OK, uh, here we these projects was not successful or not successful enough. And next time, we will try to improve our approach. And there is also a matter of reputation. Because uh, when I was listening to um, Antoinette yesterday talking about the IMF um, in, in the process of rethinking the way of uh, supporting countries, I think it's very important to communicate this message to countries themselves because it it's reinforces trust uh, in the in the international community. Inclusiveness um, again demand driven projects and the participation of all actors in the society and uh, effective coordination within the donor community. I know that at the OECD, for example, there is this DAC network to coordinate the donors, but I think it's not enough, and uh, there is a real effort to be to be made here. Um, to conclude, um, two um, types of measures, basic measures and more ambitious measures. <coughs> so for the basic measures, um, I think that it's important to go for um, small wins and small objectives. Sometimes we are too ambitious, and I think that it's better to have uh, modest objectives and to uh, to reach them rather than having very ambitious objectives and not to fulfill them. Um, some common sense reforms. Um, I would like to talk about a holistic approach for PFM reforms. Again, in, in a lot of uh, international organizations, for example, budgeting and taxation are in two separate departments, and it's very uh, unusual that these two departments work together. And I think in many countries, uh, developing countries, they need to have a holistic uh, um, vision and um, to integrate the revenue and expenditure uh, sides in, in the same picture. Um, in Tunisia, for example, uh, we were discussing budget transparency, and I got from the room, what about, how about um, tax transparency? Nobody spoke about tax transparency, because I was working for a department um, who 
uh, works only on budgeting, so I, I had the right only to talk about budgeting. And I think it's, it's really important to, to bring both sides of, uh, of the budget together. Uh, real and effective coordination. Uh, the role of academia and research institutes, and I, I already mentioned this before, it's, I think it's key. And engage in civil society. I don't know if the, there is any representatives of civil society in the room today, but I think there is uh, a need to, to engage them more. And in Tunisia, again, uh, civil society was the, the first to publish the budgets on, on internet. They literally stole the budget from the ministries to publish it on internet, and it was just two years ago. So it's uh, for in the context of Tunisia, it was really important, and it was a big step towards transparency, especially when we know a little bit more about the context of the dictatorship in which Tunisia was uh, living for more than 40 years. More ambitious measures. I think that um, the, the, the measures that, or the, the tools that we apply to countries could also be applied to uh, to uh, the international community itself. For example, independent peer reviews uh, of development projects. Because in a lot of cases, we use the peer review mechanism, and we go to countries, we bring, bring practitioners working, for example, on PFM from different countries to see, to analyze uh, the, the system in a country. And I think that it could be also interesting to do it uh, at the international level and to have peer reviewers from different international organizations and to look at a specific projects and to see what works and what's, what, is, what could be improved. Um, invite countries to regular meetings uh, uh, to inform them uh, because I attended several meetings uh, in which we discussed support to be given to countries and the only actor missing around the table was the country itself. So I think that it's also important to have uh, the, the beneficiaries around the table so that they can also talk uh, for, for themselves. Um, of course, improve planning to avoid uh, reforms fatigue, and I already mentioned some examples of having you know, delegations and delegations of, of the international community at the same time or uh, in a very, in a short term, uh, in a short period, which could be a burden for countries. And yeah, to, provo to provide support um, through the whole process of reforms. So we should, uh, because the, the reform is, uh, is very complex and very difficult, we should be patient. And for example, in the, the context of, uh, of the MENA countries, they are uh, going through um, transition from dictatorships to democracy. We cannot expect that within two or three years they will just achieve all the objectives because for in other countries it took decades and for some countries it could be three, 30 or 40 years. So we cannot within three years say, okay, Tunisia is not doing well, all the indicators and international rankings are not good, so we will just leave the country uh, and um, you know stop our support and stay back. I think that it's very important to be there and when it's difficult, when the, the country is going through a difficult period, it's even more important to provide support. Thank you very much, and I'm happy to continue in the discussion. Amal, thank you very much indeed. Uh